Infinity Four was the third release from Brandon Cronenberg. It stars Mia, Gypsy, Mello, De Silva, Goth, and Alexander Skarsgård. Of course, there is a supporting cast, but really, they don't get touched on too much, do they? They're almost like the, the non-playable characters in a computer game. Mm-hmm. So what were your first thoughts, Tim? Did you enjoy this one? I did. However, I thought it was more of an intellectual exercise than it was like a movie to be enjoyed. There are certain parts of it that I found pretty fun to watch. But overall, I think it's Cronenberg working out some stuff uh, of his own. And I thought it was a layered thought exercise. So I did like it. I think it it tries to do too much. It mixes its metaphors. Mm. Is this an allegory for the film industry, as you said? Um, yeah. In the way that John Favreau did that chef one, didn't he? Whatever that was yeah. called, about you know the the way that Iron Man two went. Is it a satirical swipe at the bourgeoisie? Or is it that mm-hmm. on the nose inspection of how people treat countries when they go abroad? Or is it yep yep the id the ego the super ego inspection of like I said the best way I can think about describing it is it's just completely mixing his metaphors. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'll give a brief introduction to what the film is. Yeah. So sorry. I yeah, always yeah. forget that part for people that may not have seen it, but want to hear what we've got to say about it. Alexander Skarsgård is on holiday with his maybe spouse. I don't know. Were they married, Tim? They're married. They're married. And they discover, you know, their holiday friends. And they say, we're going to this nice secluded beach tomorrow. Would you like to join us? So on the way back... There is an event, a calamitous event, that puts them in hot water with the local police. Now, obviously, it's this, it's in the way that Top Gun Maverick never truly tells you which country it's in for diplomacy. Mm-hmm. This never really names any specific country. Could be South America or it's somewhere in the Balkans. Could even be like Central America, really. Yeah. Like the Caribbean or something. Mexico. <laughs> Without me just listing countries where people can go on holiday. <laughs> 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 it was one of those moments where I was like, fuck's sake, will this guy get on with it? Yeah, we get it, mate. <laughs> Tell us about yeah. the film. <laughs> and he's taken to this like really shithole prison. They're obviously panicking, banged up abroad. Am I going to be here forever? And they give him an option. Says, For any crime, it's capital punishment. And it's exacted by the family of the person that you've committed the crime against. In this case, it was an automobile accident that ends in the death of a local farmer. Farmer's son has to exact their revenge. And, however, <laughs> and, and, however, Alexander Garsgård's character is given the option of paying for a doppelganger to be genetically engineered for the little boy to have something to kill. It's a golem mm-hmm. of the person that commits the crime. Then it just spins out of control, Tim. Let me add two things. Things. One is Skarsgård's character. He's a, a a writer, a novelist who has one novel published and has been working for six years on a follow up. And it's kind of has writer's block. So that's one of the motivations for going to this retreat is to sort of like break that block. And I think that plays into this struggling artist or an artist trying to find their muse, if you will, does play thematically going forward. And the second thing is on the doppelganger. It's a perfect replica. So it not only looks perfect exactly replica. like that person. Yeah, it has the original person's psychology, memories, everything. So it is a literal clone. And at that point, it's almost a bait and switch, whereby it goes from a thriller, in quite a fast-paced yep. thriller, to this high-concept sci-fi yep. horror. It reminds me of something that maybe Alex Patnadel would write independently. I had that J.G. Ballard's dystopian modernity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Another thing we should maybe say is that one of the motivating factors for the plot spinning out of control is Alexander Skarsgård's reaction to the murder of his doppelganger. So one of the little twists here is that when he pays for the double to be created, one of the conditions is that he and his wife have to be present for the execution, for the revenge killing. And she is, of course, horrified because it's, in her view, a person that looks exactly like her husband. However, he is titillated by it. He has a little smile on his face. The motivating factors for it spinning out of control are his. The other folks, like Mia Goth's character, kind of prey upon that and walk him into the spiral. And it combines science fiction with almost like a magic realism. Like this Mm -hmm. um, psychedelic orgies. Like it's a very sexually motivated film because he's lusting after Mia Goth's character. 
uh, Gabby. Gabby. Yeah. Gabby. And the way that the orgy scene was shot was a lot like some of the scenes in Possessor. Very abstract. That Argento use of colour with filters and sort of Dutch angles and... And the way that some of the characters were, in the traditional way, you'd want two talking heads to be at almost one third points of the shoot. But you have someone that's facing the narrow side almost at three quarters of the way across. The whole thing's shot in a very awkward way. The camera lists consistently as Mm. if it's off kilter slightly. It does give you a lot of pause for thought. Ultimately, as a film, it's kind of narratively lacking because... It doesn't nail down one thing or the other. Pile question over question over theme over theme. I mentioned a few earlier, I've got a list of five or six things that you could adeptly make an argument for. The J.G. Ballard dystopian modernity, science fiction against magical realism, the bait and switch of Garsgård, and, and as well the expectations of what he is as an actor. He's become this very big brute force man in something like the Northman. So you're mm-hmm. used to his characterizations actually having that agency, when in actual fact he is the meek, almost yep. visually, there's a bait and switch with Skarsgård. Everybody is their own double, like the satirical swipe of the bourgeoisie, the id, the ego, the super ego, the way that everybody wears masks commentary on the way that modern tourism works people take off those masks when they go away they're freer they're allowed themselves to just show who they truly are and, yeah. then, and then again you still have that faustian deals with the devil he wished to have belonging because his book didn't work and really mm-hmm. it was a nepo book deal anyway because his wife's father was incredibly rich so exactly. he really wanted to find belonging in the way that they set him up really ad- adequately which is something that you touched on was they said we loved your book and his yep. wife says oh you finally found your fan club yep. um but then in the way that that he found belonging he ended up simply belonging to those people completely just no yeah please no and i'm just saying when you layer that amount to consider one on top of the other it's not confusing because none of it was really illicit one of the things brandon cronenberg likes to do is he knows what inverted commas the thing is and he tells individual actors how they play into it but it's never truly spoken in into the script yeah and one thing to point out is that as the movie continues on past the point at which the eldest son of the farmer who's killed kills um james so it's the scars guard character is named james james is a double and james falls in with his wife m basically leaves him because he's gone down a rabbit hole with these people and so she leaves and so he's left to his own devices left to fall in with these people that he that are in fact to him like friends but in fact bad actors one of the interesting things at that point is that he really gives in to his bloodlust at that point and it does dovetail with what you're saying about on, on how on vacation you are who you are like you have the opportunity to be who you are mm. the whole time when he's like a nice writer and standoffish with people that's the fake him that's him trying to constrain his real personality which yeah. is ultimately yeah. like born out in his lust for torture and killing ultimately and he ends up through a series of machinations killing himself so they they continually produce yeah. doubles of him. in some cases he doesn't know so he thinks it's like the cop Mm. who busted him and he has like a a hood over his head so james thinks that he's going to kill the cop who busted him and he fucks this guy up and they take the mask off and it's his double well he doesn't even know that at that point they're just saying we're going to break in and steal some of his shit some police thing of valued specific personal value to him i can't remember what it was to sort of get one over to have one over the police chief for being such a prick and then they pull him out so not only has he been tricked into killing himself he was tricked at even entering that agreement in the first instance but he embraces it completely he oh loves he does it. doesn't he yeah, yeah 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 until he finds out that he's the butt of the joke and he's just killed himself mm. which is fascinating and then there are other points at which the same thing happens we don't have to go through all of them but there are there's several additional points at which that happens and one of the interesting ones is towards the end of the movie where Gabby brings out a James on a leash, like acting like a dog. Remember that part? She's like, you got to kill this dog to complete your transformation. I think she calls it. Mm -hmm. And he's reluctant. He won't do it. And then she like lets the the James dog 
loose. It's not like he's an actual hybrid, but he acts like an animal, like a rabid animal. Yeah, yeah. And he goes after the real James. Well, or at least the James we think is real. And the James character kills the dog, beating him to death. Oh, and that's yeah, when he yeah, yeah. yeah, completes his transformation right after that. Like she comes up to him and she had been mocking him and berating him the whole time. And now that he's completed his transformation, she comes up to him as like a mother figure and takes out her breasts and starts breastfeeding him. Yeah, yeah. It's almost as if he's reborn, right? Like the transformation is a rebirth and he's now an infant, mm. a blank slate, if you will. Did you think that side of things was salacious or do you think that it was in keeping? I actually thought that was pretty effective. I, I liked yeah, it. I um, it's weird, certainly, but I thought it would, I thought it made sense. It's definitely like depraved. Like I said, like there's so many depraved things in this, like an adult man breastfeeding off of like a woman. But um, I thought it was in keeping with the themes. I, I kind of liked it. There was the, the technical orgy as well, wasn't there? Uh-huh. I like the way that it didn't subjugate the women in, in it. Like it was all very, I wouldn't say consenting, because that makes it seem like too cold, but everyone that is very aware of that, their exploration of everybody around them. Because totally. you, and- you think to start with, it's, it's James and Gabby, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And then as this disorientating use of colour filters and the way that the camera moves, you, the first person you see is one of the other guys in this sort of like cabal, just frantically wanking at the end of the bed. And totally, then, totally. And again, that's kind of like a bait and switch because I'm just sat there going, Jesus Christ, Mia Goth's tits are amazing. <laughs> like literally, <laughs> I'm just sitting there going, they are fucking, inc-. like I'm thinking, I did not, I did not think she had it in her. <laughs> you're like drawn into this like sexualization of an actress but then it flips to the next shot and you're watching a man frantically wanking at the end yeah yeah, and he's yeah, yeah. really fucking giving it some misery. it's like he's got pistons in his arms like <laughs> well he's like a stand-in for us you know like, yes yeah it's an ind- it's an indictment of the audience yeah yeah yeah. So it's not without its moments. <laughs> totally. I agree. I, I absolutely agree. It, it is not without its moments. You know, the interesting thing, too, about that psychedelic sex orgy scene is that throughout the movie, Cronenberg, he mutes all the colors. It's very interesting he does that. It's like a cold color palette, which is interesting yeah, 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 to yeah. juxtapose against like what is supposed to be the beautiful landscape, right? It's like it's some like tropical island ostensibly should be like gorgeous and imbued with all sorts of color. The only time we really get any color is during these psychedelic scenes. And on that sort of technical aptitude, I know we've spoken about scores in the past, but I want to note Tim Hecker because uh, I've listened to a couple of his albums in passing and I really enjoyed them. He has this kind of instrumental, electronic, industrial, but no less melodic approach, kind of like how I imagine if some of the great composers were around today and they had the tools at their disposal. When you tie that into the J.G. Ballard themes, this score fits at least some of the proposed themes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You know, now that we're talking about it, I maybe like it a little bit more. Although, again, I don't think it's like fun to watch necessarily. It's not like an enjoyable film. It's It's not, but it's not Mother either. No, 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 completely. Yeah. Yeah. I find that happens quite a lot when we have these talks that one of us will be a little bit cold on it. It's probably usually me because I'm a Mardi gun. <laughs> Miserable fucker. Or maybe that's why people aren't listening to the podcast because of my cursing. Maybe Spotify's not sharing it with people because of my potty mouth. Oh, <gasps> No way. Yeah, well, yeah, because if it's explicit. Really? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Like on, on YouTube, if you swear, I think, in the first 30 seconds, then you get demonetized. Oh, wow. Effectively shadow block that video. The last thing that I have to ask you, Tim, mm-hmm. we loved Mia Goff in Pearl and X. How do you think she shapes up by comparison in this film? Oh, I think she's tremendous. The acting in this for the two leads is great. They're both excellent. And she is, she has such range, ultimately. She's excellent in this film. I, I loved her. I thought she was tremendous. I thought she overacted a little bit at the very, very end because she becomes maniacal, whereas I thought she was more, maybe it was in direction, but when she's screaming 
on the car. car. Yeah, she felt like she was very much in control of the situation. And there, she, like I said, it was almost maniacal. And what I noticed is when you have a large mouth, you can change almost entirely physically by just exposing more of your teeth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She has got some chops, mate, I tell you. <laughs> Proper chops. And not yeah. just acting chops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought I liked her in this a lot. It's difficult, too, because like you said, you have these role playing characters that are just secondary to the, to the film. And you have these two principles that are carrying the entire thing. And it's it's a complicated balance because mm. the, the film is it's self complicated. So I think it takes like some some serious skill to carry it off. It looked great, though, didn't it? I think if there's one thing that I'm that I'm not uncertain about. It was, it yeah. was a delight in filmmaking. Would you send someone to see it? No. no I don't I think do. I would either. If I recommended this to people, I'd feel responsible for them going, what the fuck is this? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't think I would send somebody to see Infinity Pool, but I wouldn't dissuade them. Like, if they were interested in seeing it, I certainly would not be like, you don't see that. Like, I would... I discuss it with people, but I wouldn't like. I wouldn't recommend it. I don't think. Yeah, that's exactly it. I'd like if someone was going to watch it. I'd be okay. I, I'm interested to know what you think afterwards. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't send. I wouldn't try and change anybody's mind. Yeah, totally.